Hi there, my name is Dr. Shanmugam. I'm a medical graduate from the University of British Columbia. In this video, I will tackle the basics of scaphoid fractures and their management. This project was completed in cooperation with Prashan Pillay and plastic surgeon Dr. Janine Roller in Vancouver, Canada. During this discussion, we will cover scaphoid anatomy, fracture epidemiology, etiology, classification, presentation, and management. The scaphoid is located on the radial side of the wrist and articulates with the radius, lunate, capitate, trapezoid, and trapezium. It is our largest carpal bone resembling a cashew and is almost entirely covered by articular cartilage. The scaphoid has a proximal and distal pole. The central portion between these poles is known as the waist. The scaphoid blood supply originates from the radial artery, which splits into the superficial palmar artery and dorsal carpal branch. The dorsal carpal branch supplies approximately 80% of the scaphoid blood flow and does so in a retrograde fashion. When fractures of the wrist or sorry, when fractures of the waist or proximal region of the bone occur, patients are at risk of avascular necrosis because of the retrograde blood flow pattern. This may lead to delayed healing or non-union. The major ligaments attached to the scaphoid are the scaphocapitate ligament, the radioscaphocapitate ligament, and the scapholinate interosseous ligament. The scaphocapitate ligament binds the scaphoid and capitate. The radioscaphocapitate ligament connects the palmar surface of the distal radius with the scaphoid and the capitate bone. The scapholunate interosseous ligamentus, the strongest scaphoid ligament, acts as a, the primary stabilizer, connecting the scaphoid and lunate carpal bones. These ligaments are important in scaphoid fractures as a tear leads to displaced fracture or carpal instability, which requires surgical intervention. One study suggests that roughly 34% of patients with a scaphoid fracture have an associated carpal ligament injury. Carpal instability is defined as an injury in which there is a loss of normal alignment of the carpal bones and or the radial lunar joint. The scaphoid is the most injured carpal bone. In fact, scaphoid fractures account for 10% of all fractures of the hand. In comparison, fractures of all other carpal bones combined only account for 8% of all fractures related to the hand. Males are at a higher risk for scaphoid fractures than women. These fractures are unusual in the pediatrics population and the elderly population predominantly affecting young males. The mean age of a scaphoid fracture is 29 amongst this population. Two external forces underlie the mechanism of scaphoid fracture. First, let's examine the rotational force. This force is usually produced by a hyperextension of the wrist. A common patient story includes a fall on an outstretched hand, which we aptly shorten to the acronym FOOSH. These falls occur during various activities such as skateboarding, skiing, or snowboarding. The second force that leads to a scaphoid fracture is direct axial compression, which usually occurs when a patient has punched an immovable object. History and physical examination are key to diagnoses and management of scaphoid fractures. The most common finding in patient history is a recent fall on an outstretched hand. Symptoms typically include pain localized to the wrist, swelling of the dorsoradial wrist, and pain in the anatomical snuff box. The snuff box is a small triangular depression located on the dorsoradial aspect of the wrist, best seen when the phalanges are extended and the thumb abducted between the extensor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis tendons at the level of the carpal bones. Signs of a scaphoid fracture include decreased range of motion in the wrist, decreased grip strength, pain during supination and pronation, and pain during axial compression of the thumb. Plain x-rays are commonly used to assess scaphoid fractures. However, they can miss up to 16% of these. The most accurate imaging modality is a CT. It is the best modality to evaluate fracture location, angulation, displacement, fragment size, extent of collapse, and progression of non-union or union after surgery. MRIs are not typically used to assess for an acute scaphoid fracture. However, they do provide additional benefit 
for ligamentous injuries, carpal instability, and scaphoid vascular status. Scaphoid fractures can occur anywhere along the carpal bone. However, they are most commonly found in the central or waist regions of the bone. Approximately 65% of all scaphoid fractures occur in this area. The second most common location is the proximal pole with a prevalence of 15%. Depending on the location of the fracture, there's an increased risk for avascular necrosis due to the retrograde blood flow found in the waist and proximal region of the bone. Furthermore, the location of the fracture helps determine the management. Management for a scaphoid fracture can be roughly broken into two major pathways, one of which is non-operative, the other being surgical. The most common interventions for each management type are shown on this slide, and we explore these in more detail in the following slides. As an important note, it is important we speak with patients to discuss the advantages and disadvantages, possible risks and benefits of each procedure type uh, when discussing reasonable treatment options. Indications for non-operative management include an incomplete fracture, a fracture in the distal third of the scaphoid, which is generally stable and has good blood supply, a fracture in the middle third of the scaphoid if it is non-displaced, i.e. less than one millimeter of displacement, and stable, meaning no angulation and a normal carpal alignment, or a patient who is low demand or high risk in which they are too sick and cannot tolerate an operating room procedure. The most common non-surgical intervention is a thumb spica cast. The cast should allow for finger and thumb IP joint mobility and be below the elbow as there is no statistically um, large significance in the difference in the union rate, time to union, or further complications. Immobilization can be between six weeks or longer depending on clinical and radiological evaluation. Indications for surgical interventions include any proximal front pole fracture as there's a high risk of compromised vasculature in this region and displaced fractures. A late presentation of greater than three weeks since the injury occurred with no treatment, any displayed fracture in the waist or distal as well as proximal pole fracture due to the retrograde blood flow that could lead to avascular necrosis must be treated with surgical management. Perilunate and scapholunate ligamentous injuries are beyond the scope of this presentation. However, concurrent ligamentous injuries can lead to the loss of normal alignment and collapse of the carpal bones. A scapholunate angle greater than 40 degrees or greater than three millimeters of displacement also indicates a surgical intervention. This is known as the humpback deformity. High demand patients such as athletes or musicians may require a faster recovery and thus surgical intervention may be warranted. Finally, any community fractures require operative inventions and may require a bone graft. Surgical management usually involves the use of pitch screw or K wires to reduce and fixate the scaphoid bone into anatomical position. Advantages to surgical management can include earlier range of motion, earlier return to work, and earlier return to day-to-day -day function. Complications, however, can include proud hardware, fracture fragments, migration of hardware, and reduced area for bone grafting for non-union management. This concludes our review of scaphoid fractures. I hope you learned a lot, and I want to personally thank you for listening. We hope that you found the video easy to follow and urge you to access the referred material for further explanation of scaphoid fractures. Have a great day.